Hi everyone, my name's Jen, I'm an author and a book reviewer and I thought I would start a new reading vlog today. The other week I uploaded a video where I talked about 20 books that you could read in a day, all books under 200 pages, books that I had really loved and I thought I would like to read lots of short books myself over the next week or so and as I said in that video it's not because I'm aiming to read loads of books at the moment I mean let's face it this year for me is probably going to be much uh quieter on the reading front than in previous years for obvious reasons but I'm just having the itch to read from lots of different voices read lots of different perspectives and short books are a great way to do that so that's why I would like to do that this week also I'm spending a lot of time at the hospital at the moment which is very boring but very necessary and that was the case last month too and last month I decided to combat that because there was a lot of waiting around I would read a lot of crime thrillers things that were page turnery were easy to read because that was what my brain needed at that particular time but then it didn't actually end up being the best reading month ever. I read some books that I loved and then towards the end especially, I don't know if it was me, if it was the books, if I was just generally fatigued. I mean I definitely was generally fatigued but if I was fatigued with the books I was reading as opposed to other things I just, I don't know, it wasn't working for me. So I want to try something different, I want to read lots of different short books, lots of different stories and hopefully that will keep me occupied during hospital waiting times and I will have more fun. So that is the plan, that's the plan and in this introduction I'm just going to show you briefly books that I have <laughs> taken off my shelves that are some of the shortest books on my TBR. Obviously I'm not going to be reading all of these in this video and I may even pick up some that aren't even on this pile but even if I don't get to them perhaps they serve as some kind of inspiration for you anyway. So the first lot which I'm not going to go through individually are these here which are pamphlets by Strangers Press who I've talked about a lot on this channel before. They're an independent publisher based in Norwich. They publish chat books in translation. They have different series. So they have two different Japanese series. Uh, two different Korean series, one series from Lithuania, one from Switzerland, one from the Netherlands and it's just a great way to be introduced to new writers and they're super short, all of them are about 50 pages each so I may read a couple of those that I haven't read yet. There are so many short story collections that I could have picked from but I think I've selected two, yes I have, so we've got the Truth Has Arms and Legs by Alice Fowler. This says it's a poignant short story collection that explores the pivotal moments that transform our lives. Jenny, whose life is defined by small disasters, discovers a bigger, more generous version of herself. A traveller girl might just win her race and alter her life's course. A widow cut off in a riverside backwater opens her heart to a stranger. Then we have Karate Chop by Daughter Norse, which I've had sitting on my shelf for ages. This was actually gifted to me by the lovely booksellers at Seven Oaks Bookshop when I was there doing an event a couple of years ago. This is translated from the Danish by Martin Aitken and it says, in these glittering tales, Daughter Norse sketches ordinary lives taking unexpected turns. A walk amongst the herons in Copenhagen inspires depraved thoughts. A woman in an abusive relationship searches for explanations. A man Googles female serial killers while his girlfriend sleeps sounds intriguing. Another publisher along with Strangers Press that's great for short reads is Fairlight Press. So this is Fairlight Moderns. These are small, can fit in your pocket, short little novellas and this is one that's been sitting on my shelf for a while. It's called Milton in Purgatory by Edward Vass. This is a novel about a man called Milton Pitt who is hit by a speeding car on his way to work and for a fleeting moment he thinks he's a butterfly. Then he wakes up in bed as if the morning's event has never happened and he's one wondering if he's dead and he's trying to work out what is going on. I had to pick a John Wyndham because I have hauled quite a few of his recently and I thought I should probably read the oldest one on my TBR which is Chucky. This is about a boy called Matthew who has an imaginary friend and his parents are worried about this because he's 11, they think he's too old to have an imaginary friend. It says this presence Chucky causes Matthew to ask difficult questions and say startling things. He speaks of complex mathematics and mocks human progress. Probably a good one to go to after the Midwich Cuckoos which was the last of his that I read. 
Another set of books which is on the shorter side, we've got the Faber Edition series. This is They by K. Dick. K. Dick was the partner of Kathleen Farrell, who wrote Mistletoe Malice, which Faber republished recently. She was also an editor, um, and she was George Orwell's editor, which is pretty cool. So this is a dystopian book, so one that I may pick up. Then we've got Concerning My Daughter by Kim Yi Jin, which is translated from the Korean by Jamie Chang. This is about a woman whose daughter comes to stay with her, and her daughter doesn't tell her that she's bringing her girlfriend with her. And then the mother, I think, is very homophobic, and it's about them trying to exist in each other's spaces. Foster by Claire Keegan is one I've been meaning to read for a while. I didn't love her book, Small Things Like These, which so many people did, but I have loved her work for a really, really long time, which sounds like I'm saying I loved her before she was cool. That's not what I mean. But um, I did read her short story collection, Antarctica, which I think actually came out in the late 1990s and absolutely adored that. I didn't read it in the 90s. I probably came to it maybe 2009, 2010, I don't remember. And then I read her second short story collection, which was called Walking the Blue Fields. But yes, I would love to read Foster. In fact, I'm sure I'm gonna read that one in this vlog, so I won't talk about the blurb here at all because this book is so, so small. I think it's about 60 pages. Then we've got Disembodied by Christina Tudor Sideri. This, I think, is about a woman who has died and then she's having an out-of-body experience, watching her body disintegrate and talking about the world around her. Paradise Rocked by Jenny Haval. This is translated from the Norwegian by Mayim Idris and it is about a woman who's in a strange new country for university and she's having a more peculiar time than most. In a house with no walls, shared with a woman who has no boundaries, she finds her strange home coming to life in unimaginable ways. I think that this one has body horror. Then we've got Eliza Shuadasapin's The Pachinko Parlor. I read her book Winter in, Sh in Sokjo and didn't love it, but I do want to give her another go. And this is translated from the French by Anissa Abbas Higgins. It says, in a summer in Tokyo, Claire finds herself dividing her time between tutoring 10 year old Miko in an apartment in an abandoned hotel and lying on the floor at her grandparents' home, daydreaming, playing Tetris and listening to the sounds from the streets above. When her grandparents first arrived in Tokyo, fleeing the civil war in Korea, they opened Shiny, a pachinko parlor. Shiny is still open, drawing people in with its bright flashing lights and promises of good fortune. And as Miko and Claire gradually bond, a tender relationship growing, Miko's determination to visit the pachinko parlor builds and with it, Claire's own desire to visit Korea with her grandparents. I also would quite like to pick up this, which is another writer whose work I've read before and didn't immediately love, but would like to try again. So this is Natsuko Imamura's This is a Miko Do You Copy. She is the author of The Woman in the Purple Skirt, which I enjoyed, but just, it fell a bit flat for me. So this is about a girl called Amiko. It says she's one of a kind, full of life and good intentions, but with no filter or boundaries. She happily inhabits a world of her own, oblivious to offenses given or taken. But when it comes to expressions of love, where conflicting signals are hard to grasp and a heart is easily broken, there can be unintended consequences. This is translated from the Japanese by Hitomi Yoshio and is part of the Pushkin Japanese novella series. And as I said, I might pick up others that are on my shelf as well. We'll see how I get on and where the mood takes me. I'm gonna be very much dictated by mood this week. So. I will check back in with you when I have read something. Thank you very much for joining me. I'll be back in a second. Hi, it's a few days later. I come to you standing. At the moment, I have days where I just, my body will not sit down. And today is one of those days. So we are standing, but at least you get to see some more bookshelves this way. I got this in the post this morning from lovely Lauren over at Lauren the Books, who I'm sure you know, but I will link her channel in the description box down below. She made me this for my birthday. I know that she's taken up cross stitch. Maybe she started just before Christmas, but this is super adorable and it's for our kitchen. It's lots of different kitchen utensils. Unfortunately, the post completely decimated the frame that she sent it in, but I have other frames that it can slot into. So I will sort that out at some point. I think, sorry, breathless, I think in this video, I'm gonna come back uh, every 
couple of days and update you on my reading as opposed to every day. I mean, let's see how we go. But at the moment I have two books to mention, though one of them unfortunately was a DNF. Let's start with the one that was not a DNF. So I decided to begin with This is Amiko, Do You Copy? by Natsuko Imamura, which is translated from the Japanese by uh, Hitomi Yoshio. As I mentioned in the introduction, this is by the author of The Woman in the Purple Skirt, which is a book about a woman who wears a yellow cardigan, who is obsessed with this other woman that she sees out and about who's wearing a purple skirt and she tries to orchestrate this woman's life. She leaves newspapers on the bench that she always sits on in the park, circling uh, job opportunities at the place that she happens to work so that she hopes she can get to know her. It was one of those books that I, I wanted to read anyway but I was also secretly hoping would be in a similar vein to Notes on a Scandal by Zoe Heller. You know it's one of those books that I've always tried to find a companion novel to and have recently done so in the form of Fed by Catherine Chidgey if you missed me talking about that book and you've also been looking for a book that's like Notes on a Scandal this gave me all the same feelings and now I feel satisfied and uh, happy <laughs> and can relinquish my quest for that type of book I'm sure I'll get the itch and want to find another book like that in the future anyway I read The Woman in the Purple Skirt I liked it, I didn't love it, it felt a bit lacking to me, um, not as dramatic as perhaps I had hoped um, and sometimes a bit directionless and it's one of those books where you feel like the directionless is probably deliberate because the main character feels quite lost but ultimately that doesn't then equal a fun book to read. This one I enjoyed a lot more than The Woman in the Purple Skirt but I still wouldn't say that it's something I would highly recommend. I think if you enjoyed The Woman in the Purple Skirt, you will like this. And I think if you enjoy work by um, Miko Kawakami, I think you would also like this. I, I think, I feel that maybe the imagery in this is a little bit heavy handed. You almost feel like you're being fed a bit too obviously by the author. So this is about a girl called Amiko. She is neurodivergent and she's trying to dissect the way her family members communicate with each other and there's lots of imagery to do with communication in this so her stepmom runs a calligraphy course in the house and then she also has these walkie talkies which you can see on the cover and she just finds that she's not able to bridge certain societal gaps that other people find very easy to traverse and she's not always aware of this herself. I was at times reminded of Miss I Sandwich by Miko Kawakami which is translated from the Japanese by Louise Hill Kawai which I did <clears throat> really enjoy. I just didn't enjoy Kawakami's book Heaven very much, or breasts and eggs actually. It jumps around time-wise, which I thought was quite interesting, which can leave you feeling a little bit uprooted and you have to keep stabilizing yourself, re-stabilizing yourself, which reflects what Amiko is doing a lot of the time too. This book actually particularly reminded me of Emily Northam's book, Strike Your Heart. It also reminded me of the book, Nails and Eyes. All of these books are to do with step parents and also have like Snow White imagery in them as well. So yeah, it was a quiet book. I enjoyed it. I think it was the right size, the right length being that short. I don't think I would have enjoyed it had it been a much longer novel. The one that I decided to DNF is They by Kay Dick. This one I was aware hadn't had brilliant reviews since it came out and I try not to let that cloud my opinion of a book when I'm going in. On the whole I try not to like, look at other people's reviews of particular books before I get to them for that reason but I was just aware, not of the specifics, but I was just aware that this one hadn't had the most favourable reviews and it's the writing style for me um, that meant that it wasn't really to my taste. It reminded me, obviously they're in no way related because this is a classic and the book I'm going to mention is a contemporary book, um, of Mrs S by Kay Patrick which I DNF last year for the same reason. Both of these books are written in a very staccatoed way with very short sentences and in the case of They by Kay Dick which is a dystopian I think that it's done in this way to create that feeling of things being disjointed to make you feel detached from what's actually being spoken about. He said that, she said that, they did this, then they did that. It creates this chronic 
recycling feeling, but it also makes it feel slightly unreal. Um, but to me, it felt a bit over stylized. It felt like style over substance. And um, it's supposed to hold you at a distance, but it became a little bit exhausting to read. I will give you an example. The canvas she was painting was blue. Jake went outside and cried. Omar licked his tears. I joined Carr in the library. The windows opened onto the terrace. You can come here as often as you like, Carr said. He stood at the open window and looked at the sky. Shall we go and see Claire, he asked. The ground floor of the lodge had been converted into a studio. I looked at the painting Claire had just finished. It was yellow, all yellow, every variation and depth of yellow. I could hardly bear it. I went outside and rolled on the grass. So yeah, this one is not for me, sadly. I will pass this one on to somebody else. I think the next one that I will head to will be Foster by Claire Keegan. So once I've read that and another one, I will come back and report to you with my thoughts. Hi, it's a few days later and this reading vlog is going well. I know that we DNF'd They by K. Dick, but we're not gonna love every book that we read in this video. I'm not gonna kid myself, but enjoying the majority of them is the aim. And I have read one which I, well, it's very early on in the year to be saying, I think it could be one of my favorite books of the year. But, but so far, it's definitely one of my favorite books of the year. Um, but let me start with a separate one which I also enjoyed and that was Foster by Claire Keegan. I feel like I was a bit unfair in the introduction, I've just been editing this vlog as I'm going and I said that I didn't really love small things like these um, and that's true but I feel like I want to add a bit more information to that. I think everyone or at least it felt as though everybody absolutely adored that book so much when they read it. And if other people are, are hyping something, are really, really adoring something, and you are just not connecting with it in that way, I feel like it almost lessens your overall enjoyment a little bit because I felt like I was missing a trick, I was missing something. I was not part of the gang, the clique. <laughs> it's like, I'm just out of this loop. I am not having the same emotional connection. And that's an added frustration as well as all of just the actual thoughts I had about the text itself. I appreciated that it was a good book, but it just didn't have that emotional tug for me. Maybe I'm dead inside, but also not because this one made me cry. <laughs> I don't know what it is about Claire's writing because she doesn't actually write in dialects or anything like that. But whenever I read her work, the voice in my head, the voice that speaks to us when we're reading a book, it's it reads the text in quite a strong Irish accent. And I think that's just proof of how brilliant she is at bringing places and people to life, at making them feel very rooted and dragging you to that place too. As I mentioned in the intro, this is a very, very short book. I think I said it was 60 pages. It's not, it is 88 pages. So I really don't want to talk about plot at all. Even though I would say the plot is not the focus of this book, this book is more about the feelings that it tugs out of you. It's about a young girl who is sent to live on a farm because her mum is expecting another baby, her family are very busy, and they also don't have much money, so it would be very helpful to them for someone else to look after her for a while. Time feels very sticky in this. At the beginning, when she's sent to this new place, it feels very permanent and very heavy, but I think that's because when you're young, everything does feel very permanent because time moves in very different ways to when you're an adult. Being in this new place is like forcing her into this new fixed form and that's emphasised by the fact that she has to wear clothes that aren't her own and everything just feels quite alien. She's also really confused because being in this new place is filling her with warmth and she's feeling a sense of belonging that she doesn't always feel at home and this makes her feel guilty and I think that that's so accurate because as a kid we internalise so much if, if emotions are confusing, if we don't have the words to articulate it, we think it must be something to do with us rather than those around us and this new setting is giving her a sense of peace and grace which she's never been granted before and oh it made my chest hurt. 
the very last line of this book I think says so much and again I don't think that this is a spoiler by saying this because it's just the one line and again from what I've said already and from what it says on the blurb you'll get this point anyway that she's feeling a sense of home in this new space so the last line of this book is where she runs to Mr Kinsella who is um, the man in this new place that she has moved to and she says daddy I warn him I call him daddy and one that reminds me of the railway children so it just makes me want to cry <laughs> and in the background of this is her father too so there are these two men and she's running towards mr kinsella daddy i warn him i call him daddy so it's like she wants to call him father but she's also warning him that her father is there or alternatively she is warning him that she wants to call him daddy. She's warning him that she feels this way towards him when she knows that maybe she shouldn't. But also it's ambiguous because you could think that she's not saying that to him at all. She could be saying it to her actual biological father who's also there. So you can read and reread that scene, play it out in so many different ways in your head. And each one of them made me want to burst into tears. In fact, it didn't just make me want to burst into tears. I did cry at the end of this book. I thought it was really, really affecting. I know this has been turned into a film um which i wouldn't mind checking out if i can find it anywhere um and i also know that Paul, um, small things like these is being turned into a film at the moment with killian murphy which i don't think i mentioned in the intro if i did i'm sorry for repeating myself but the book that i think well i know is definitely one of my favorite books that i've read so far this year and maybe could cling on and still be one of my favorite books later in the year let's not get ahead of ourselves it's only february but that is the pachinko parlor by eliza shua dasapin which is translated from the french by anisa abbas higgins and i'm so pleased that i ended up loving this book because i felt so ambivalent about her first book winter in sokjo and as i was reading this and loving it i was trying to work out why do i love this one so much more than winter in sokjo i think partly that's because winter in sokjo centers around um not particularly a romantic relationship, but a potential romantic relationship. And I just generally don't care so much when I'm reading a narrative that is centered on that. I should probably tell you what this book is about. So this is about a young woman called Claire, who's moved from Switzerland to Tokyo for the summer to stay with her grandparents who are Korean, but have been living in Tokyo for decades. And while she's there, she is teaching French to a young girl called Miko. On the back, Amina Kane, who's the author of Indelicacy, which was one of my favorite books, two years ago. She says this is a very cinematic read and I would very much agree with that. Let me read you the first paragraph. I step out of the train and plunge into the narrow passageways of Shiragawa Station. Lime scale on the walls, plasma screens, flashing toothpaste ads, a woman with a gleaming smile, a tide of people rushing by. Outside workmen are dismantling a building site. A platform overhangs a garden, cherry trees, enclosures where salary men gather to smoke, puffing jerkily on their cigarettes, stubbing them out on rocks that look like stones that horses lick for salt. I love that all of the scenes in this book feel like that, like a dripping painting, or like the characters are existing in some kind of tank, or are living underwater, are walking through water, which slows everything down and distorts things a little bit. It's like you're looking at the characters through a window with rain on it and can't really work out their features. It makes it feel very humid, which reflects the humidity of Tokyo during the summer, but also creates this cloying feeling, like the past won't let these characters get dry and exist in the present. They're always being held down a little bit by what came before. In that first paragraph, we have tides of people. In another scene, Claire is lying on a bed like a starfish. In this scene here, we have Miko and Claire standing at the top of an emergency staircase where air vents cling to its surface like leeches. Smoke billows up from below. Looking down, all you can see are low-rise buildings, no higher than the lampposts, lights coming on in the windows, signposts, no cars, Everything seems to float like jellyfish in the sky. Claire takes Miko to Disney World where there is a domed blue ceiling, a phantom ocean, the land of the Little Mermaid, and Miko lives with her mother in this hotel and her bedroom used to be a swimming pool, so it's an empty swimming pool and her bed is in the middle of this emptied, I guess, like tank. Um, ceramic tiled mosaic tank and I thought that, that was 
so beautiful to picture something quite Wes Anderson about it, I suppose. The humidity in this book and all the water imagery reminded me of Anne Yu's work in both braised pork and ghost music, using similar imagery to create a sense of drowning or uh, jet lag or sleeplessness. Because at first Claire does feel as though she is just jet lagged all the time before she realises that maybe it's not just jet lag that's making her feel like this. It's just everything around her doesn't feel particularly real. And she finds herself having a nostalgia for things that she can't really possibly be nostalgic about. So for instance, she longs to go to Korea and she would like her grandparents to travel with her to Korea, but she's never been there before. She's romanticising it in her head. And then Miko's mum romanticises Switzerland, where Claire has travelled from, and renames herself Henriette and has an obsession with the book Heidi. Again, transplanting this nostalgia into a history that is not hers, something that she has not experienced. It's like people are replacing their pasts with something they wish was there instead as a form of reinvention, but there's a great sadness to that. And with Claire travelling to places like Disneyland, and then to the zoo, and then to the aquarium, and with this image of the pachinko parlour, which her grandparents run, it has this backdrop of capitalism trying to make people happy, but really it's just presenting false hope or things in cages. This is also highlighted by the fact that her grandma wants to play Monopoly all the time. I think that there are so many things going on in this book and that they're brought together in a really subtle way. I think it's saying a lot, but it doesn't feel like it's shouting at you. Or if it is, it's shouting underwater so everything ends up feeling a little bit muted. I think very similar themes were being explored in her book Winter in Sokjo, but for whatever reason, they didn't work for me in that one. But I think that they're brilliant in the Pachinko Parlour. So if you have not read this one, I would so, so recommend picking it up. It's so textured and it has this plot point in it that does seem to creep up a lot in Japanese fiction. I know this is not Japanese fiction, but it's set in Japan, where there are people living in an apartment block where nobody else lives. So Miko and her mother live in what was a hotel and is going to be converted into something else, but they're the only people who live there now. And a similar thing is in Strangers and in Spring Garden and I think it's being used to show how alone and lonely you can feel in a really busy, bustling place. But I don't know, I have a soft spot for that repeated imagery. Um, so yeah, those are the two books that I've read since we last spoke, all good things. And hopefully the next time I report back, I will also have more good things to say. I'm aware that I don't have any exciting B-roll footage to share in this video. No cooking of elaborate things or taking you on long walks or anything like that. Life is just not like that at the moment. So um, I hope that that's okay. We'll get back there one of these days, um, but I will um, see you in a couple of days when I have read a couple more books. I hope that you can't hear the people working on the roof across the way. <laughs> if you can, I'm sorry. Um, I'm normally not someone who minds filming, um, but they can definitely see that I am filming a video and I can see that one of them is perplexed as to what I'm doing, which is, to be honest, fair enough. I've had a semi-successful last few days. I've read a book that I really, really enjoyed and I read one that I wanted to like but sadly didn't love but would still recommend to many people because I think that lots of people will love it. So let's start with that one. It's a short story collection called The Truth Has Arms and Legs by Alice Fowler. Sometimes it's hard to pinpoint why a book doesn't work for you when you can also objectively see that the writing is good, which is the case with this one. But there are just a couple of markers, I guess, in here that aren't what I'm particularly looking for in a short story collection. So all of the short stories in here are very short. They're not flash fiction, but they're only a little bit longer than that. So you don't get to spend much time with the characters. Each of them feels very much tied up you know, in a bow, very precise, and is set 
in a very specific time and place, which again, sounds like that shouldn't be a criticism, but bear with me. Um, so the first story, for instance, is about a girl who's a traveller. Then we've got a story set just before the First World War. My favourite story was an older woman who was getting her makeup done at a makeup counter as a way to like reclaim her image again. Um, I really like that one. Then we've got one about IVF. Alice Fowler is a journalist and I think that reflects the way these stories have been put together. It feels like a writer who's researched lots of different topics that they're interested in and has then decided to write stories about those things. And even though I guess each story is about a pivotal moment in someone's life, thematically I wouldn't say it's hugely linked. And I think I just prefer a quieter short story collection about less, I was going to say dramatic moments, but they're not always dramatic moments in these stories either, or at least I suppose they are to the main characters, but maybe not to anyone who is observing them. Maybe slower short stories is what I mean, where we have more time with these characters. And also I do now these days, wasn't always the case, tend to prefer short stories that are quite strongly linked in some way. And I don't mean interconnected short stories, but things like Thomas Morris's We Don't Know What We're Doing, which is about a collection of people who are all from this small Welsh, vi Welsh village. Some of them still live there, some of them have left. They're all feeling kind of lost. Sabah Sam's Send Nudes and Watching Women and Girls by Danielle Pender are stories that are all about women who are observing other people or are being observed themselves. And the stories feel a little bit spikier, a little bit more raw. I would say that I would recommend this collection of short stories, The Truth Has Arms and Legs, to fans of AJ Ashworth and Tom Fowler. I enjoy their work too, a lot, but I think that you're more likely to like this book if you like their books as opposed to enjoying, for instance, as I said, Thomas Morris and Danielle Pender. And I'd also recommend it for fans of flash fiction as well. Um, I have to hop on to a meeting, so I'm gonna go to that meeting and then I'm gonna come back to you and talk to you about the book that I really, really enjoyed. Darkness has descended because there is a storm. Can you hear the rain? Maybe? I never know what sounds are being picked up on the camera until I'm editing and you might be thinking, Jen, I can't hear anything. Please talk about the book. <laughs> so the book that I really enjoyed and finished yesterday was Chucky by John Wyndham. And I'm so pleased that I've read this one. One, because I thoroughly enjoyed it, but two, because I was guilt tripping myself. I bought this one a long time ago, along with some of the other reissued Penguin versions in this series of Day of the Triffids, The Chrysalids, and... Uh, the Midwich Cuckoos. I had read Day of the Triffids and The Chrysalids before. I read The Midwich Cuckoos late last year and it really made me want to pick up more in the series that Penguin had just reissued but I said I shouldn't do that until I'd read Chucky because I still had one sitting on my shelf unread. I ignored my own advice, bought five or six other books <laughs> by John Wyndham and this book was sitting on the shelf and mocking me and uh, now that's fine because I've read it and I can just progress onto the others, which I'm now even more excited to read, having enjoyed this one too. This, I looked it up, is his last published work before he died. And I think it's a great, almost companion piece to the Midwich Cuckoos because it feels as though one of the characters from that story has been transplanted into this one. That's not what's actually happened, but he's definitely exploring similar themes. So in this novel, we have an 11 year old boy called Matthew, who his parents think has a new invisible friend. And they're a bit exasperated by this because his younger sister used to have an invisible friend and it was very inconvenient because she would want them to set a place for the friend at the table and they can't be bothered to go through that again. And also they think Matthew's a bit too old to have an invisible friend as well. But they slowly realize that is not what is happening. For want of a better word, their words, they feel like Matthew is being possessed by this person or thing that he calls Chucky. And the reason they feel like he's being possessed as opposed to imagining things is because Chucky can 
get Matthew to do things that he didn't know how to do before. And that includes drawing things. And those drawing scenes really reminded me of Kazuo Ishiguro's Never Let Me Go and the weird art gallery that the characters had to enter their work into to prove their own humanity. The drawing segments in this book also made me think of our modern day discussions on AI and art as well, because when Chucky uses Matthew's eyes to see out of and uses his body to draw the things that she can see, at first you look at it and think that it's all fine, but the closer you look, just something seems off. Either the perspective or the humans don't look quite human. Um, and I thought that, that was really interesting. It's what I love so much about old school sci-fi, where you can start drawing parallels between their discussions of science and our modern day science. Links that this writer, Wyndham, would never have made because these were not concepts that were available to him at the time he was writing these books. Alongside these conversations about art are also conversations about gender, which equally feel as though they could be taking place in the modern day, albeit with a child who's trying to have a conversation with parents who are quite resistant to that topic of conversation. So Matthew's trying to explain Chucky to his parents and sometimes he'll use the pronoun he and sometimes he'll use the pronoun she. And his father says, look here, I told him, I get all confused with this he and she business. On grounds of grammar alone, it would be easier if I knew which Chucky is. A bit like in Pew by Catherine Lacey when people get really frustrated when they can't put people in boxes. And Matthew says, well, I I've tried to explain the concept of gender to Chucky, but they think it's ridiculous and not something that is applicable in this instance and the dad says the point is it gives me more personification if Chucky is one or the other not just an it puts a sort of picture in the mind which must be easier for him to cope with than just a vague undifferentiated disembodied something and as Matthew feels there's not much similarity to any of the boys he knows dot 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 at which point the mother cuts in and says so you've decided that she's feminine because you feel it will help you and Matthew gang up on her and they're so called out and I just love that moment. Chucky also ends up calling out humanity for relying on fossil fuels and not investing in renewable energy. This book was published in the 1960s and says, you know, if you don't think more broadly about things, then your whole race is going to become destroyed. And I, I wish that wasn't still relevant, but here we are. And this also tickled me as a final point to talk about technology and science slash science fiction. The father says at one point, I have fallen into the bad habit of switching on the radio as a background to shaving. Bad, because untroubled shaving is in itself good background for thinking. However, that's modern life. It just made me laugh that this fictional man from 60 years ago is bemoaning the fact that technology is something he's using to distract him from having deep thoughts, something that I guess is allowing him to disassociate for a while. And if that is not linked in with how we use technology now and screen time and all of that, then I don't really know what is. So yes, for all of those points and many more, I would very much recommend Chucky by John Wyndham. It's not my favourite by him, I still think The Midwich Cuckoos is my favourite. It's hard to place the others because Day of the Triffids and the Chrysalids I read so long ago, like over a decade ago, so I don't know. But as I said, I'm so looking forward to reading the other ones that I have by him on my shelf too. Okay, I would like to read, I think, at least one more book in this video because then it will be a full week and I will have read a book a day, which just feels quite pleasing. So I will tackle one more book and come back and talk to you about it. It is Saturday evening and I have the tripod perched on the bed in front of me and I'm really hoping that it's not too wonky or wobbly. We're gonna go with it because this is a comfortable position to be in. But I have read 
one more book and that was Paradise Rocked by Jenny Havel which is translated by Mayim Idris. This is about a young woman called Jo who moves from Norway to the UK to study biology and she realises that when she moves to this new place hearing everybody else speaking English and then speaking English herself makes her feel less like herself. She says, I suddenly knew nothing about myself. Nothing seemed right in English. Nothing was true. Nothing feels very concrete. When she moves into this converted brewery with um, a woman called Carol, it feels very unfinished. Um, a lot of the walls are very damp. Mushrooms grow in the bathroom. Carol brings home a load of apples and they start to rot and the whole place just smells of decay. It's very interesting sometimes when you read a book and it has parallels with another book you've read quite recently, even though they're not linked in any way at all. This one reminded me quite a bit of the Pachinko Parlour because of all the discussion of things being damp, almost like everything's underwater, creating this really sticky, humid feeling, which is uncomfortable to spend a lot of time in. It was evening, Carol chit-chatted and leafed through a glossy magazine while chewing on her thumbnail. The apples rub gently against each other in the cupboard and in the bowl. The glass shards in the chandelier clinked. In my biology compendium, I read a chapter on extinct sea creatures. The TV was muted and flickered behind my back, reflecting on the railing. And all the while I could hear this hiss and bubble that I didn't quite understand, as if we were far down on a quiet seabed and listening to wind howling on the surface. The fact that this place that she's moved into is a converted brewery is like the building itself is an unfinished work in translation it was one thing now it's been translated into something else but she doesn't feel as if its new form particularly makes sense to her also brewery brings to mind images of fermentation as well which would fit in with all of the rotten imagery that's going on elsewhere in this book if you don't like not that i think anyone really likes but if it really bothers you to read about body fluids you are not going to enjoy this book. And that way I was very much reminded of Eileen by Atessa Moschweg. And sometimes, yes, I did feel like parts of this book veered into the I am trying to shock you, as opposed to the disgustingness adding a lot to the book itself. But for the most part, I think that all of that evened out. This is a book about how there aren't really boundaries between things, either between words or between people, between the rooms in a building, between things being edible and inedible. It means that everything ends up feeling quite murky and close. Also, each of the characters is almost integrated with a particular text. So Carol, her flatmate, keeps on reading and rereading this erotic novel. Pim, who lives next door to them, is writing a novel and is trying to write the two women into it and Joe almost darts between these stories trying to work out which one she would rather be a part of which narrative she would like to get sucked into and that image of being pulled into something against your will is definitely prevalent throughout the whole book I also really like the book's use of colour here's an example of that her voice follows me like a yellow beam of light when I cross the kitchen floor and up the stairs to the landing the chandelier trembles and the glass stalactites are dripping I sit by the living room window and study my own mirror image, glowing blue-white lips. I think all of this rotten imagery, the gaps between meaning and understanding, the missteps in translation are there to highlight the disappointment of growing up thinking it was going to be this brilliant, wonderful, empowering thing and everything just being a bit of a letdown. I don't know, I really I really like this one. I think it's gonna sit somewhere in the middle of my enjoyment of all the seven books I've read this week. Let me put them in some kind of order. So I think bottom of the pack for me would be They by K. Dick, because obviously I DNF'd that one. Then after that, I would put this, which is The Truth Has Arms and Legs by Alice Fowler, which I enjoyed a lot more than They, actually. There was quite a big gap there. Then, this is a Miko Do You Copy by Natsuko Imamura. Then after that, I would say probably Paradise Rot by Jenny Havel, which is translated from the Norwegian by Mayim Idris. Then we have Foster by Claire Keegan. Then probably Chucky by John Wyndham. And then top of the pile, we have Eliza Shiodosapin's The Pachinko Parlor, which is translated from the French 
by Anissa Abbas Higgins. So all in all, a very successful reading week. I'm very pleased with the books that I got to. I would love to know if you've read any of these or if you would like to pick them up now you've heard me talk about them. I will list them in the description box down below as well. Thank you very much for joining me for this video. If you're new to my channel and you enjoyed it and you would like to subscribe, that would be very kind. And if you like the content that I put out on here and you would like to consider supporting me on Patreon, that would be very lovely. Patreon is a place where you can tip creators whose work you really enjoy and the support over there allows me to keep creating free content for you all on here and also funds my time making it accessible by creating captions and all of that good stuff. I hope to see you for another video next Sunday and I am sending lots of love to you all.